This is Criteria. Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Criteria, the Catholic film podcast. I'm James Majewski here with my co-host, Thomas V. Miris. Hey, Thomas, how's it going? Hey, James. Thomas is calling in from out of town uh, in your nice, fancy hotel room there, I see. Uh, I'm at yeah. home. Um, I, I I may sound a little different, dear listener, uh, and I assure you it's not because uh, my my voice has suddenly dropped down into a sultry baritone like Orson Welles, um, but it's because I have a cold. Um, so I'm going to do my best to, to power through. I, I, I entirely lost my voice just a couple of days ago, so this is already a, a huge improvement, but uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. I, I, I did think, Thomas, that one advantage to this is that I'm, I, could, I, could, uh, I could say my favorite line from the film that we're going to be discussing. Okay. Don't worry about me, Getty. Don't worry about me. I'm Charles Foster Kane. I'm no crooked, corrupt politician. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. You know what? You know what I like is, uh, so yeah, for the listener, we're discussing Citizen Kane. We'll get to that, to that in a minute. But two things about that. First of all, if that's he's at the top of the, the stairs, right? Um, when he yells that. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, he starts in the room, yeah. Orson Welles fell fell down that like uh, stairwell or the staircase when they were shooting that and like injured himself badly. So he was like directing from a wheelchair for like the next two weeks. That's amazing. So today we're talking about Citizen Kane, um, which is on the Vatican film list under the category of art. And um, everybody's heard of this film. Not everybody's seen it. I think a lot of people are intimidated by this film. Uh, they, they, they know it's something they're supposed to watch. They know it's supposed to be one of the best films of all time. In fact, uh, it has this, this reputation partially because for like 50 years, it was number one in the British Film Institute's sight and sound critics poll that they would do every 10 years. Um, and uh, it was, you know, that that's a pretty, pretty major poll that they do. And yeah, I mean, when like, I was growing up, that was in my mind, like the best film of all time. Citizen right. Kane, you know? Yeah. And and I, I just want to say to the listener right, listener right off, people get intimidated by that or um, or some people even resent its, its status as number one. It's not the greatest film of all time. It is a great film. It's one of the most impressive films of all time. Uh, don't don't worry about the fact that don't 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 let that intimidate you. You know, it's it's a film. It's, it's a watchable movie. Um, you don't have to think it's the greatest film of all time. Um, yeah, well, and, thank you for uh, saying that, yeah. Thomas, because coming into this conversation, I was a little intimidated, thinking, oh, gee, how are we going to talk about the greatest film of all time? No, I'm just kidding. But when we did start the Vatican film list, I did think, okay, let's like wait to deal with Citizen Kane until we've got right. some other notches on our belt. Um, but uh, but yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with, with what you're saying. In fact... The film, I think, really wants to be viewed as entertainment, as an evening's entertainment, and not as like some sort of academic exercise or as like some sort of on a pedestal, like greatest film ever. I mean, this was Orson Welles' first film, right? Yeah. Yeah. He was 25. Yeah. Uh, so this film's from 1941. Orson Welles um, had been a, uh, a radio star. Up until that point, he had this Mercury Theater comp a radio company that was very successful, um, and he got this movie deal at 25. And because of the success of his radio film, he got complete creative control and final cut privileges as a director, which was on, like basically unheard of in the studio system. And a lot of other people were annoyed at him for getting that on his first film, uh, but were like jealous of him. But yeah, he was 25. He directed it. He produced it. He wrote it along with Herman Mankiewicz, and he starred in it, um, which is unbelievable. It is. You know? And it's still his best-known film. And he made but other, many other great films, but this is the best-known one. Um, and uh, he also brought in a lot of the Mercury Theater people 
um, most of the main cast, this was their first film for all of them. Right. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not just a good movie, but it is this, this movie that has this incredible reputation and it's an incredibly virtuosic, uh, work of directing and acting and, and writing and all. Totally. Of those yeah. It would be one thing for him to have just done all of those things, you know, fulfilled all of those roles. But the right. fact that every one of those is done in such an exemplary manner you know yeah. the 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 writing is phenomenal the visuals are amazing and yeah. the acting dude like Orson Welles's performance is just through yeah. the roof yeah he's 25 in this movie but he plays a man at all you know all stages of life from young adulthood hood to old age um the makeup in this movie in general is just incredible that the, the, because they age and have to age a number of characters and it's very convincing generally yeah. um uh, but yeah, so, so Citizen Kane is, um, it's, it's, it's a story about the mystery of a, a person, um, and, and what defines their life and what's, what's in their heart that, that goes deeper than what everybody knows about this person, in particular, a famous person, a famous and powerful person, uh, who was in the public eye for most of his life by his own design, um, Charles Foster Kane is the um, he, he begins as a, a relatively poor young boy being raised by his his parents in the boarding house that his mother runs. They have a tremendous windfall, and all of a sudden, he's no longer poor, but he's he's basically inheriting the sixth largest fortune in the world by the time That's he's right. an adult. So he's sent away yeah. by his parents um, to be raised by. By a banker, presumably because this is what's going to prepare him for for being a rich man, you know, and knowing right. what to do with his money. But the result, the consequence is, you know, not unexpectedly, that he has a lot of resentment and uh, he he uh, you know takes um, makes choices that sort of uh, run up against the way he's been brought up by this banker, and so right. he becomes a media tycoon, um, owning. Uh, a newspaper um, distribution um, in uh, what, what? Where does he get his start? I guess it's in uh, in New York. Yeah, I think so. Um, but uh, but but in every major city in the United States, eventually, um, he's basically the news guy. Um, but he also does forays into um, philanthropy and politics. And um, I understand that he's he's based in part off of some real characters in his Yeah, so so most famously this he's based on William Randolph William Randolph Hearst of the, you know, yellow journalism, you know, uh Spanish American War fame, you right. know, we learned about in high school. Um but not exclusively, there's other, you know, newspaper famous newspaper men that he was also based on. Right. And Hearst famously opposed this film and was trying to, you know, trash it in his newspapers and and stuff. Um, but, uh, it's not, ju it's not just about Hearst. Um, uh, I, 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 on a personal note, you know, this, this film has, uh, it starts out with the castle that, uh, Charles Foster Kane eventually builds on, in the deserts of the Florida Gulf coast, which I don't think exists. I don't think there are any deserts, uh, the Florida Gulf coast, but, but, uh, called Xanadu, and this is based on Hearst Cat, uh, what's now called Hearst Castle, which I've actually visited in San Simeon, California. Well worth a visit, by the way. Uh, it's still owned by the Hearst Estate, and they they allow people to tour it. Um, and uh, it's just this unbelievable castle built and filled with treasures of the world, you know, the, the plunder of the world. Wow. Uh, Spanish 16th century Spanish ceilings, you know, works of art from all over the world, especially Europe. Um, you know, lamps with lampshades made of old Gregorian chant uh, manuscript, you know, vellum uh, uh -huh. lampshades and uh, anything else you could imagine. Um, and indeed, Hearst did have uh, a private zoo with all sorts of ex exotic animals on the hillside surrounding the castle, as we see in this in this film. So. Uh, so that's one of the one of the aspects that's you know based on Hearst's life. I don't think we need to go too much more into that because it's not the most interesting aspect sure. of the film. Sure. Well, well, but, but you know, at the beginning, um, when we're sort of being introduced via this uh, this newsreel um, that sort of serves as a kind of prologue to the film, um, 
uh, we're being introduced to the character of Cain and his life um, by way of a kind of obituary. Uh, right. They they say that um, what do they say? They say they describe Xanadu, which is like this this incredible palace that he's built for himself. They say it's so big it can never be cataloged or appraised. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 right. so, something yeah. like that's repeated from time to time. That that it's sort of like yeah. an impossible project to really ev- evaluate. Um, put put a put a price tag on like what all the wealth that's there. And and you know I think that there's an obvious connection to draw to where this film's real interest lies, which is um, the appraisal of the human spirit. Um, you know who. What makes a man? Uh, yeah. So, so the, the thing we didn't say uh, is that this film is not just about Charles Foster Kane, or or the way that it is about him is through the lens of this journalist who's trying to discover the last mean the meaning of Charles Kane's last word, which is rosebud. And so the whole film is um, is is seen through that frame. Um, now, to finish orienting the listener, we should talk about the, stru- the unusual structure of this sure. film. Um, sure. So the film begins with successive shots of, of Xanadu, this, this mansion. And we see, uh, coming closer and closer to this one lit window in Xanadu, we see the death and the last word of Charles Foster Kane. Uh, then it cuts suddenly to this newsreel that you referred to, News on the March, which is a parody kind of of... Uh, uh, I think it was Time that used to do these these newsreels in much the same style. Um, and so we get the whole plot of Charles Foster Kane's life from beginning to end in that, you know, several minutes. So we've already we've already been told the whole plot, right, in, in, in outline. Yeah. Um, then we are introduced. Then it cuts from there to the room of jur- journalists who have made this newsreel and they're they're screening it before deciding whether it's good enough. And uh, then this one journalist gets set on the quest. They want to get deeper into who this guy was, not just repeat the facts that everybody knows about his life and uh, all the publicly known things. And so what's, well, let's find out. Maybe his last words, we can find out what that means. Maybe they'll tell us something about the man. And, and so the rest of the film is framed uh, through the, the investigation of this, of this journalist and the stories of the different people he consults. So first he goes to Kane's second wife, Susan Alexander, he fails to speak to her. She's too drunk. She's not in a good place. Uh, she won't talk to him. Then he goes to the memorial library of Mr. Thatcher, who was the banker who raised Kane. And uh, he goes to look at his unpublished memoirs and the, the section of his manuscript that deals with Charles Foster Kane. And so we get a, a good chunk of Kane's life from childhood to adulthood right there. So, so the story isn't even... It's not like it's all just in chronicle, chronological order. We're getting these different looks at at whole chunks of his life, right? And, then and, and, and importantly, to, importantly, it's from the perspective of these people right. who are being interviewed. Right. You know, that's right. And then we get uh, he goes to uh, Mr. Bernstein, and Mr. Bernstein is the um, the business manager, I believe, of the of the paper that Charles Foster Kane first takes over, and, and just his business manager in general. Um, we get his recollections. Then he goes to Jedediah Leland, uh, who is uh, was Charles Kane's closest friend, but they had a falling out. We get his last re- recollections. Finally, he goes to his second wife, Susan Alexander, again, and she tells him some things. And we see more of the very end of, of Kane's life and how they eventually split up. Then finally, we do get one. Uh, and then he goes to Xanadu and he talks to Kane's butler. And he's trying to find out what Rosebud means. He doesn't really find out much from him. And then at the very end, we get away finally from the perspective of this journalist and we get an omniscient perspective uh, where we actually see, find out what Rosebud is. So it's a very interesting uh, and unusual plot structure. Um, Many people have commented that it feels like a puzzle. Right. And, And this metaphor of a puzzle is even used in the film because we see Kane's second wife, uh, putting together jigsaw puzzles when she's really bored in, in the castle towards the end of the film. But it's also suggested that finding out the meaning of this puzzle 
putting this puzzle together, that the meaning of Rosebud, it might not actually tell us much more than we already knew. There's some suggestion that um, that the the meaning of a man's life can't necessarily be discovered by these external details. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of where I was going and drawing this connection to that line about something being so big that it can never be cataloged right. or appraised. Right. You know, this is the attempt in the wake of of Cain's death is to basically appraise his life and um, and the, the 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 seed, the key that's going to unlock it is going to be this dying word. Um, and I mean, I think that like, that's, that's a brilliant device. First off this, like, um, it's, it's, it almost casts it as like a murder mystery. You know, he hasn't been murdered, but there's this like clue, there's this mystery to who he is. And, uh, it, it even has this like film noir vibe after, right after that, uh, that newsreel ends and we're in this little like you know cramped uh, viewing room with these journalists you know smoking cigarettes and there's the light from the projector and people's faces are shrouded in darkness you know it just it feels like the beginning of a detective story and then we're mm -hmm. then we're all of a sudden at this uh you know nightclub to talk to Susan Alexander it all just like feels like this uh you know gritty uh thing right which you know allows that to sort of stand in contrast to the uh you know these these different vignettes from his life which tonally are so different like some of the mm -hmm. vignettes are very comedic some of them are very dramatic you know others are like anywhere in between we get like right. we get like you know dancing numbers with like you know full like uh yeah, you know, song and dance and there's like a whole like supporting line of 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 girls with rifles and then we have you know other parts of like political intrigue or 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 marital struggles, you know, things that go from like the most intimate to the most sort of uh uh you know, writ large. I mean, this is a very large personality that we're talking about with Kane and and a large performance that comes from Orson Welles, but but I think that like this structure one, you know, is super cinematic in its approach. It's a narrative structure that's a lot more difficult to accomplish on on a on a stage, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And it's perhaps something. It's a perhaps a kind of freedom that the novel has, that maybe even radio has. That might be where Orson Welles is 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 you know. Uh, that's but, very plausible to me. Yeah. Um, at uh, because of the quickness of the cuts, you know, the the the, the way that radio programs are, they're they're not as long as a film generally. There's there's like a there's like I don't know based on the radio theater things that I've heard um, from right. that era, uh, there are these quick cuts, and the way the music is used is very much in the radio style. It's like these transitional little stings rather than background for the scenes much of the time. Yeah. It's like these really quick little transitional musical cues that Bernard Herrmann, who, who this was also his first film score, and he became one of the most prominent film you know composers ever, uh, did. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the radio connection uh, that's that's very plausible to me, and yeah, it uh, maybe maybe the reason you're saying it's it wouldn't work as well on theater is that you can't make those cuts in the same quick way right. that you can. Right, and I mean it, this is something this is something that theaters have to contend with anytime they do say uh, Christmas Carol, um, <laughs> but but it's certainly not easy. And so yeah, so aside from being like a, a narrative structure that really leverages. Uh, the cinematic form in a very powerful way, I think, very effective way. Uh, it also enables the story to reach these highs and these lows and to have all this color and variety in dealing with, um, you know, a man's life. You know, in some ways, like this film has to contend with the the, the problem of the biopic. Now, this isn't a biopic, uh, but but it's it's still like faced with that problem of of how to condense and select and to highlight and the way that that gets resolved via this sort of meta story of the journalist doing his research i think is quite ingenious and uh you know it just it just like is a nice it's a it's a really excellent device um and keeps us on our toes 
keeps things super interesting. It's a very snappy picture, you know, so it doesn't yeah. drag ever. And then, yeah, it's, 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 it's fueled by this mystery of like, well, let's get to the bottom of this. What, what's the meaning of Rosebud? You know, do you, do you find that compelling as a puzzle? Like the meaning of Rosebud? Do, yeah. do you actually, are you actually curious throughout the film? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And I, and I was actually afraid that there wouldn't be an answer at the end. You know, and do you find the end without maybe without spoiling it? Do you find the answer interesting? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to get to with this this puzzle thing. Is like, is the puzzle thing, you know, um, is the unusual story structure like, you know, commensurate with? Uh, and we don't have to answer this now, but is the unusual story structure like, is it much ado about less? You know. Uh, than the film, than the film's like subject matter, you know, war warrants, you know, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that about like the cinematography or the acting, because those are just quality things. I think that the thing that I question most about this film is, is whether the unusual story structure is, is more of a distraction. Yeah. Um, well, I, I think that um, the fact that Rosebud has like, so much cemented itself in the like popular psyche of, right. of you know of, of 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 the United States of of the West um, of of cinema everywhere. Um, right. I think that that speaks to its effectiveness. You know, I th I think that it is compelling. But you don't think that what Rosebud is is that interesting? No, and I I wonder if the film is served. By giving us an answer at the end, I don't know. Now, it's the, hard now, to the, say. now, now, the film explicitly makes a point right before we find out what Rosebud is. We hear people saying, "Maybe it wouldn't really explain anything anyway. Like maybe you can't like explain a man's life, you know, in, in that way." And so, yeah. so maybe and, and, the film and is granted, also about like the futility of our attempts to find out the meaning yeah, of somebody's yeah, and first listen these and external details. Grant that when they, we do find out what Rosebud means, it really doesn't like give us a conclusive answer as to like the significance of yeah. that, you know, like it gives us more ideas. It asks, it, it raises more questions. It narrows things down maybe, but I think that the film is at its weakest when characters, the secondary characters sort of like venture into psychoanalyzing Kane. And uh -huh. to whatever degree that the film does that, I think it's it's sort of running against its better parts, what makes it most interesting. And why is that? Because it's so eloquently showing the depths of a man. You know, it's it's like it's we get we get the the superficial treatment right off the bat. We see right the newsreel and we we got it and we get it not just because like we've been told you know we understand uh the the bullet points of this fictional character we get it because we know kane we know these people especially as americans i mean you we've already mentioned hearst but take any like business tycoon uh you know folger or uh uh Rockefeller or Carnegie, these like incredibly wealthy, powerful men. Heck, today, Bezos and Musk. I mean, how often are we hearing about Musk and talking about Musk and have an opinion right. about Musk? You know, right. um, in fact, I was thinking about Elon, Elon Musk's uh, takeover of Twitter during the scene when they come in to the newspaper for the first time. Uh, it's like this super hilarious scene where uh, – they're sort of like turning the house upside down and Mr. Carter is getting like all flustered. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's a great comparison. And by the way, you know, even Donald Trump, like Citizen right. Kane, I think he, I think he said it was his favorite movie or one of his favorites. There's a, there's a, there's like a few, a few minutes video they can find on YouTube uh, where the documentarian Errol Morris is asking Donald Trump. It's from, it's from like the nineties or something to, to talk about Citizen Kane. Yeah, I saw that video. It's amazing. Yeah. It's really incredible. It's amazing because his takeaway is that Kane should have gotten himself a different woman. And it's just like, 
<laughs> it's just so funny. It's like exactly what the, the sort of thing you would expect <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump to say. Uh, his takeaway from this tragic story would be. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think he's being a little tongue in cheek, but probably. But probably. it's it's yeah. it's it's a great little uh, little clip. People should look it up. Um, what I was getting at is that. I think as Americans, especially, we're acquainted with this character, uh, the Mr. Monopoly, basically. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And and so we have our ideas, we have our opinions, and 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 what this film does is it like, you know, yeah, it humanizes this character, but it 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 like does something more than that. It turns his life into a mystery, into like a a. A, yeah, a puzzle that we're trying to solve, and right. uh, and like that, that like really draws you in, and yeah. and it and it you know it it does so through the through the device of this this dying word, but like what it's really doing is plugging you into the deeper mystery, which is that these people, humans, were were these incredible sort of like bottomless. Um, uh, unfathomable, you know, we're in the image of God. Like that's like bottom line. That's it. Uh, that's like the rosebud, you know? And so, so I, uh, yeah, like, I don't know if, if getting more information at the end about what rosebud means, um, really serves that thematically. And, right. and, you know, uh, when we're when we're given these these like yeah these forays into psychoanalysis from these secondary characters, I don't think the film does enough to frame those as like reductive or insufficient. I think that it's actually the way I saw those was was that we were actually getting another piece in the puzzle that that this was like an honest appraisal. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's it has to fall short. You know, um, and so, so yeah, so like, I th I think that like, if you were to look at this film as like, and I don't know, I, I I'd be interested to hear what Orson Welles himself may have said about this because it very well may have been that he was like coming at this from from a, sort of a Freudian uh, psych psychology perspective. I mean, that was like very hip at the time, um, right? So. But but I think that like if you view this if you view this film as a Freudian um, uh, exploration, it it's flat, it fails. And like whenever those like Freudian psychoanalytic aspects start to drift in, I think it it actually minimizes the greatness that's there, which is I think you know a spiritual recognition of of man's greatness of man's you know, sort of larger than life identity because it's it's not just Cain, it's all of us. So Cain is a is a helpful conduit for this. He's he's a helpful guinea pig because his huh. his life on earth is is bigger than life. But for all of us, this is how it works. And and you know, the film has some some the film definitely has some things to say about his psychology. I mean, one of them is that he wants love. And so yeah. he's he's driven by this need for love, presumably from wounds that he has had as a child and being given up by his parents, you know? I mean, but who of us doesn't have wounds and who of us doesn't have wounds from our parents? But, yeah. you know, the more he he finds fame and acceptance and notoriety, um, prestige, the more lonely he becomes. But you know, you don't have to like become the richest man in the world to learn that. Uh, there's an amazing line after he's lost his election. He, he, he tries to run for governor and uh, it's the, the only time he runs for office and he doesn't, he doesn't win. But um, he's speaking with his, his, with his basically only friend. This is the dramatic critic for the newspaper. Um, and Je Jedediah, Jedediah Leland, he calls him out on on basically like what what's where he at, where he's at in his life and like what's become of him. I've set back the sacred cause of reform. Is that it? 
All right. That's the way they want it. The people have made that choice. It's obvious the people prefer Jim Geddes to me. You talk about the people as though you own them. So they belong to you. Goodness. As long as I can remember, you've talked about giving the people their rights. As if you could make them a present of liberty. As a reward for services rendered. Jed. Remember the working man? I'll get drunk too, Jedediah. It'll do any good. Uh, it won't do any good. Besides, you never get drunk. You used to write an awful lot about the working man. Oh, go on He's home. turning into something called organized labor. You're not going to like that one little bit when you find out it means that your working man expects something as his right, not as your gift, Charlie. When your precious, underprivileged really get together, Oh, boy. That's going to add up to something bigger than your privilege, and I don't know what you'll do. Sail away to a desert island, probably, and lord it over the monkeys. I wouldn't worry about it too much, Jed. There'll probably be a few of them there to let me know when I do something wrong. Mm. You may not always be so lucky. You're not very drunk. Drunk? What do you care? You don't care about anything except you. You just want to persuade people that you love them so much that they ought to love you back. Only you want love on your own terms. It's something to be played your way according to your rules. So, yeah, so Jedediah says, yeah, okay, you know, you'll, you'll probably sail off to some desert island and lord it over the monkeys. And... Kane still riffing on this, joking around, says, yeah, there'll probably be a few of them there to let me know when I do something wrong. And then, right. and then, and then what, what his friend says back is, you may not always be so lucky. Mm. And, uh, I, I just think that that's like, so true for all of us is that it's an, especially, it's a special danger for the famous and the wealthy and the powerful to sort of be ensconced in these bubbles where nobody wants to say the wrong thing to them. I mean, that's like one of the criticisms of the Star Wars movies from George Lucas, the prequel movies. You know, they I've heard people say, well, he was just too big and nobody felt, you know, right. they could say no to him. Mm. Um but I imagine that this is like a problem for for everybody who who achieves like a certain level of of status. But certainly for all of us, like in our in our in our relationships with the people that we love and who love us, you know, it's like it's not real. Like you need to have you really need a love that's gonna like correct you. And and like bust through your pretensions, um, right. and challenge you, and uh, and that's something that that precisely that that a lot of us are precisely working to eliminate from our lives, you know, and to run away from. So it's like this is a long winded way of saying that like Cain as a character is a fascinating stand in for all of us. He he because he's he's this really big, larger than life figure it throws everything into a greater relief but but the 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 dynamics there are are really relevant for everyone i think yeah 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 i i certainly agree and you see that the mix of youthful idealism and resentment and neediness that drives him you know going forward and it, until eventually he just becomes this crabbed and bitter old man who's alienated everybody and finally alienates his second wife one of my favorite bits is the scene where uh he so so kane has um his second wife he, he's decided she's going to be a singer she's going to be an opera star and she doesn't really want it she had mentioned when they first met that she kind of wanted to sing but more her mother wanted for it she didn't really have a voice to, to sing opera but so he decides she's going to be trained she's, he keeps making her take lessons even though she's doing terrible he he builds her an opera house to, to have her premiere in for in chicago and uh then he's going to have everybody in his paper 
uh, you know, write, write good reviews from the dramatic department, the music department, you know, everything. And, and, uh, you know, there's a whole aspect of this story with her that's fascinating. But, but what I wanted to bring up specifically was the scene where he comes to the newspaper office. Everybody's got their reviews in except for Leland, who's the, the dramatic, uh, critic. And Leland has fallen asleep. He's been drinking at his typewriter and has fallen asleep and, uh, hasn't finished his review. And Kane, uh, and they've already been a little bit on the outs, but Kane picks up this review and starts reading it. And, uh, Mr. Bernstein, the business manager is there and sort of very, very apprehensive about what Kane's reaction is going to be. He thinks he's going to break out into a rage over this. The fact that Leland has started to write a review, absolutely panning, you know, the, the acting ability of, uh, of his wife, Susan. And, uh, and what instead Kane does is he doesn't wake up Jedediah. He just goes into the next room and finishes the review with the same opinion and the same style and, and just pans his wife's own performance and then fires him. <laughs> but that's like a fascinating look into that, into his psychology, you know, that, that he is, it's almost like he's trying to demonstrate that he has some kind of integrity or, or, or it's like, or it's like his last gesture of respect towards his friend. And it's like, that's the last time they're going to talk. They can't be friends, nor can he work for him after having, you know, disrespected him and disrespected his wife. But this last, this, this last gesture he's going to do is he's not going to make him write something that he doesn't believe because he has that much respect for him. So I, I thought that was just a fascinating scene. Yeah. There's a lot of tragedy in this film. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's tragic when his first marriage ends. It's tragic when he takes this poor woman and, and forces her out to be humiliated repeatedly as this failed opera star, <laughs> um, horrifying. you know, and, and it's, it's like this, it's like this, um, this, this, uh, I, I don't know. It's like this Sisyphean task of, of him, like trying to make her voice beautiful uh -huh, i I, right. I i think it's so fascinating because it's like the hubris thinking like that i can take something not beautiful and and will it to be so you know right um so that's and tragic and, it, and then and then yeah the, him, it, it says he says we're gonna be an opera star <laughs> so it's all about his ego yeah yeah and then and then there's the tragedy of his his friendships ending and you know him alienating himself from everyone and then eventually his his power and influence wanes you know and and right. so it's like he loses everything he gains everything and then he loses everything and yeah. um it's served well by this very like tragic performance that's given by Orson Welles i mean right. it's it's shakespearean in its in its uh, scope and stature, and uh, and of course, like we know that Orson Welles is he's 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 a, a very accomplished Shakespearean actor even at this right. point in his life. But uh, you know, all of that gravitas is present here in Kane, um, and 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 in the story of his life. I think that like the moment in in the film when. It's sort of like the gravity and the tragedy like reaches its highest pitch is when his second wife leaves him and he yeah. just destroys her room. You know, he just like goes on this right. rage and it's, yeah. it's an incredible sequence. Yeah. Um, Cause I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's mostly just shot in one take. There might be like a couple edits in there, but it's, it's not a lot. And it's, and it's quite lengthy, you know, it's not just like yeah. he knocks over one thing or, or a couple of things like, and then we cut. He's just to, demolishing the whole room. He's pulling down curtains. Yes. Orson Welles actually cut himself quite badly on his arm and was bleeding towards the end of that scene. It's amazing. Uh, he like cut his arm on some kind of shard of some broken object. It's incredible um, because like he's somehow able to capture and, and you, you have to remember that this is a 25 year old dude in like. A, like a, a fat suit and like makeup or whatever. Like he, he's, he's m m inhabiting this old, yeah. old body 
So he's the way play- he walks around the stilted way that he walks around is yes. fantastic. Yes, yes, and and you can tell that he's getting worked mm-hmm. up and that his breath is getting short. You know, and he he's right. working himself into exhaustion. He's working yeah. against his body, but he he has to like just like rage. You know, it 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 like feels like Lear or something. You know, and it's uh, I I I was just I just was so riveted and. Yeah, it's it's not a short sequence because we see like every little thing that he goes to to upset and to destroy. And and sometimes he's not even successful. He tries to pull something down and it won't come off and then he he goes somewhere else and it's it's just so uh uh yeah, like such a such an amazing performance um and the sort of thing that like uh, I, I I don't know, like it felt like it was channeling um that sort of transmutation of space that is the purview of theater, you know? Um, I mm-hmm. imagine that like when they were shooting that sequence, it was very silent on set and like people just like felt something, you know? Yeah. I wanted to talk about the style of the, the film too. I mean, we, we've alluded to it, um, the, the sort of virtuosity of the way it's edit, directed and shot and edited. You mentioned this is a snappy film and, the impression of the, the the impression so much of the impression of the film is it's like a one it's like one uh amazing image after another at this rapid pace you yeah. know it starts out it's it starts out really slow it starts out with this great um uh the sequence of shots going closer and closer to the castle and what's interesting about it is that even though it's showing different parts of the hillside and the surrounding area of the castle the light in that one lone light in the window is always in approximately the same place in the upper right hand of the frame. And it's sort of kept, we keep getting these like dissolves and going closer and closer. And then we finally get to, we finally get to there and then the light in the window goes out and then it comes on again. Mysteriously. It's like, what made the light go out is it's like this surreal thing but yeah. it's very effective well what's really the rim. well what's really surreal is that the light comes on and we're inside you know right. so the light goes we're yeah. outside the window light goes out and then as it comes back on we it, we realize that it's illuminating this body like we're inside you know it's a very seamless transition yeah. of course this is accomplished by a physical stage light being turned on and off but right. like but right. but but the story that's being told in that is is quite quite incredible in fact that whole opening sequence that this visual montage is, is just amazing and it filled with match cuts and like all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, cool, cool. The, the, the nurse being in like the fisheye lens yes. of the, he drops, he drops this, uh, snow globe yeah. and, and we see the nurse walking in and the, through the snow globe. Yeah. And, yeah. And this is yeah. not the only time that a cool, a cool montage like that is done. There's another great one with, um, like sort of summing up her uh his his second wife's opera career with all of the yeah. the the um headlines and the front pages of papers and then cut with you know or overlaid with you know it's there's layers we're seeing like uh you know all these other images on top of those it's it's really really quite amazing and 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 effective like it 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 affects you. That's like the thing that yeah. you have to understand about these visual sequences is that they 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 accomplish something not just in terms of delivering narrative, but in doing so in a certain way, uh, conveying right. a certain mood. The editing is done by Robert Wise, and there's so many memorable cuts. I mean, um, for example, um, there's 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 sudden cuts taking you from one time period to another, so that the the one of the big ones and early is, is when he he uh, is having Christmas as a kid with uh, with Mr. Thatcher and, and Mr. Thatcher says you know Merry Christmas and then it cuts to much older and a Happy New Year yeah you know yeah um, that that's one of the the startling early yeah. early transitions um, and uh, there's it's 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 really taking you through a lot of plot very quickly I mean the movie isn't it's you know it's a little under two hours there's a lot going on and uh, and then there's also a lot of really cool dissolves and crossfades and like images superimposed, as you mentioned. So uh, one of the ones that I like is when it's fading out of Leland's recollections, we've got this typewriter 
remaining in the right in the upper right hand corner of the screen as we fade back to the hospital where Jedediah Leland is sitting, and it sort of lingers there for a moment. Um, and uh, you know, um, what else? There, there's so many great crossfades or the, the reminiscences. There's there's a, there's a wonderful cut combined with camera movements as the, the one of the most famous scenes in the film is with his first wife at the dinner yeah. showing the deterioration of their marriage right. where uh, they're they're aging and they're in different costumes and, and we're sort of like the camera's like quick pans to the right and it's like as though it's turning around the table uh and then we're seeing each one of them and how they're responding to each other and then we finally get a wide shot of the table where we see the table has gotten longer and longer over time and they're sitting at the end, at opposite ends of this really long table from each other. And it's just, what's well, one of the most famous visual yeah. things in the film. Yeah. My, um, my favorite transition is uh, like the last one when it cuts to the aftermath of, of his being uh, left by his second wife, there's like this superimposed image of a parrot that like squawks and then flies a away. It's like a sudden yeah. cut to a cockatoo and it shrieks. And it's like, it's one of the more surreal moments of the yeah. film too. Where yeah. It's like, it's very, it's very startling. You know, it's, it's almost like a yeah. jump scare moment, you know, but, uh, yeah, but like sets the right mood for what's to follow. There's also one moment of what you could call like sound, a sound crossfade or something that is very strange. And it's when, uh, uh, Kane and uh, Susan, uh, Charlie and Susan are, are are in this tent. They go for like this this lavish, you know, um, you know, picnic camping trip, you yeah. know, in, in the Everglades. Yeah, and they're in this tent, and he and he she's complaining, and he finally slaps her, and then in the ensuing at the very end of the scene after he slaps her, she's not screaming, but you all the all of the the sounds of the party outside. Uh, fade away and you just hear a woman screaming in the background and it's not explained so it's like this psychological effect yeah that's like very non-realistic yeah um and that's yeah. that's a really cool moment as well it's awesome i mean yeah you know like maybe maybe they saw a crocodile or something you know like but like right but it, yeah yeah the the effect is 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 really unsettling um yeah yeah. And, um, and, you know, that's not to mention the, the sort of the cinematography itself and, and the lighting and stuff, you know, um, it's, well, the, the whole thing is, it's, again, this guy's 25 years old. The way that he studied is one of the productions advisors made him like a, 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 a sort of an ad hoc film textbook, like a, a reference book for film techniques that he studied really carefully. And then he, he taught himself by, watching the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and like matching the techniques in the, the film textbooks to what was identifying them. Like in that film, uh, he ordered the film from the museum of modern art. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, you didn't have, you know, VHS or, right, DVD right, or whatever. Right. Um, and then he would watch films like Capra, Fritz Lang, King Bedore, Jean Renoir. And the one he film he studied the most, and I think we mentioned this before, uh, was John Ford's stagecoach. He he said that he watched it forty times and uh, forty like, times. Uh, yeah, yeah. Whoa. Um, yeah, and uh, the first time, as he said, the first time, day he ever walked on to a set was his first day as a as a director, and he said, "I learned whatever I knew in the projection room from Ford." Uh, and uh, he said, after dinner every night for about a month, I'd, I'd run stagecoach, often with some different technician or department head from the studio, and ask questions. How was this done? Why was this done? So he did this like accelerated film school, wow. essentially. Wow, it's incredible. Um, and the other big thing was his collaboration with cinematographer Greg Toland, who was already known as one of the most creative cinematographers in the business at that time. And he and Toland made a point of trying to work with yeah, with new directors because he felt that there was always more room for experimentation. With a, with a young director who didn't know what couldn't be done, who didn't have preconceived notions about what couldn't be done. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the stories from early, early on is that when they were setting up lighting for scenes, Wells didn't know that the director of photography's job is to do the lights. He thought it was his job. So he was walking around the set to, uh, to tell people where to put the lights and what to do. And, um, and whenever somebody and Toland was following him around, whenever somebody started to like try to tell him that like uh uh you know, no, that's 
that Greg Toland's job, Toland was like would like interrupt them and like stop them from telling. And and uh, and finally, uh, somebody like got irritated and told him, and and Wells was like really embarrassed and apologized. And Toland was like mad at the person for like spoiling it because he said that he the only way to learn in this business is to learn from someone who doesn't know what can't be done. Um, wow. Whoa, yeah. that's cool. And one of the other really thing, things about Greg Tolan that I found very impressive um, is that he told Wells he could teach him everything he needed, needed to know about cameras in one weekend. And then he did. And Wells was very impressed that any kind of like technician in the business would say that every, his whole his craft could be learned in a weekend and then teach you. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so that's very impressive. And and the result was that Toland got his credit on the same credit card at the end of the film with Wells, which is again unheard of. There's a number of a number of things that are sort of unheard of. One of them is that is the opening credits with no music and just the title of the film. That was unusual at the time, right? And then and then at the end, you get Orson Welles and Greg Toland on the same screen. Um, so that was, that was how much, you know, Wells felt that he owed to Toland as a collaborator. Wow. And, uh, Toland is known in particular for what's called deep focus, which is where everything in the frame is equally sharp, like from, from close to the camera to far away from the camera. And that's done with various tricks of lighting and cameras and, and stuff. Um, and that, so that's a big uh, part of this film. And in this, in the few instances where they couldn't get deep focus, uh, naturally they would like, um, superimpose like two frames together to make it look like it was deep focus. I see. Um, and, uh, the, one of the other distinctive, uh, things about the look of the film that Tolan did and, and Wells was big on was low angle shots. There's like a lot of really low angle stuff where they see the ceilings, which, which is very unusual. It makes you feel like you're in a real place when you can see the ceiling and that was not done in films because often they would want to have lights and mics right. up top. Right. Right. But, right. But Wells would have these really convincing looking ceilings made like out of cloth, for instance, and put mics above them and, and things like that. So wow. um, just a lot of technical innovation. Uh, and um, the film is just like, it's almost dizzying that the pace with which it runs through these incredible images. Right. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a big part of why, why the film is considered a masterpiece. Totally. Yeah. You know, and I, I would also want to say to, to listeners or to anybody, especially who has not seen this film is that, uh, you know, this is like a, this is a very entertaining and a very watchable film. And especially if you're an American, I feel like it has a, like a a thematic hook in being right. like kind of like I, I see it as an American folk tale, like a cinematic folk tale. Um because we know this character, because there's like something so emblematic of the American spirit, you know, it, it's it, it's it's something that actually Kane says several times throughout the film, you know, I'm an American. Um But it made me. It also made me think of a film like *It's a Wonderful Life*. You know, I feel like *It's a Wonderful Life* has a similar kind of scope in sort of looking at a man's whole life, mm -hmm. um, and it also has a similar sort of American sensibility. Right. Um, obviously, you know, *It's a Wonderful Life*. This is a small town guy, and Citizen Kane is is quite the opposite. But but I think that if you like It's a Wonderful Life and if you wouldn't be intimidated by It's a Wonderful Life, then you really shouldn't be intimidated by Citizen Kane, you know? That's a great, that's a great comparison, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one is about ambition realized and then the other one is about ambition, you know, not realized. Right, <laughs> right, right. They'd, um, make, they'd make for an awesome double feature. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Never thought about that. Yeah. Very interesting. Um. And you know, in in Kane, it's uh, that the, the object of his nostalgia is this, the snow globe with the little house inside it, and yeah. uh, that's what you actually get in uh, in It's a Wonderful Life. But Kane never makes it into the 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 nice warm place of uh, It's a Wonderful Life, yeah. you know. Um, right. 
I think that we should. Um, I, I think we should totally discuss more Orson Welles, Welles films. I would love down that. The line. I would love that. Um, this is uh, by far not his only great film, and there may be better ones. You know, he made a, 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 an also pretty epic film after this called The Magnificent Ambersons, which I enjoy more as far as like the subject matter of the story. Right. Maybe a less perfect film in some ways, but but uh, that's that's a great one. Um, and there's plenty of others that I haven't seen. Uh, we did mention his Macbeth uh, when we t- reviewed the the Cohen Joel Cohen Macbeth. That's right. Uh, yeah. Movie. Um, so yeah. that's one of the few others that I've seen. But right. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm so impressed every time I see Wells, and uh, you know the fact that that this is his first film and that he's 25 when he does it. It's just it's like you could delight just in that. Even if you don't enjoy anything else about the film, you can just like have yeah. a have a good time watching like this this twenty five year old guy really transform into this into into Citizen Kane, you know. Um, right. It's it's really quite amazing. Well, uh, our next our next episode is going to be um, on the Vatican film list, also a uh, film in the in, in the values category. Um, and we're going to be talking about the tree of wooden clogs, uh, and it, it's an Italian movie, uh, directed by Ermano Olmi, and we'll be having our, uh, one of our, one of our, one of our great guests back on, uh, we'll be talking to the, uh, Catholic film scholar, Maria Elena de las Carreras awesome. uh, about that film. And, and Nathan Douglas will be joining us for that as well. Oh, so that'll dude, be- great. Yeah. I'm just going to hit that one out I've of the park. Many, I've heard many good things about this film. Um, I've heard it recommended within Catholic circles as well as general film circles. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Cool. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I'm, I'm excited for that. Uh, anytime we can get like a four person round table discussion going on a film, that's, that's, that'll be cool. And just as one last thing, I'll just r- remind our listeners that right now, catholicculture.org is in the middle of its big fall fundraising campaign. Uh, Criteria is a production of catholicculture.org. We certainly do a lot more than just this podcast. There are four podcasts in total and a lot more else besides that over at our website. We've got a $111,000 matching grant that's on the line. We're trying to raise that much by December 8th and then have that matched. So if you've never given or if you've given before, and uh, are looking to support the site even more powerfully, right now is a perfect time to do so because whatever you give will be doubled um, and really go a long way toward helping us win this grant. We we can't continue into 2023 without this grant. So head over to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio and whatever you give will be matched. It doesn't really matter how much you give. It's really that you give. We don't have financial angels. We don't have a lot of really big ticket donors. It's just a lot of committed Catholics who have been coming together and supporting this website for like the better part of 20 years. It's been really humbling for me to see that the, the power of a lot of people coming together and doing something. So there's certainly yeah. not a lot of people listening to this podcast, but if you're one of them, uh, then, uh, you know, this is, this is on you. <laughs> uh, right. no, but of course, uh, if you can't afford it, uh, if there's not a good time for you, then, uh, please pray for us, pray for the success of this campaign, pray that we'll be able to continue our Catholic mission. Um, again, there's a lot of good things that catholicculture.org does. Um, we, we get letters from all over the world, uh, from priests and missionaries and, uh, catechists, uh, lay folk, converts, um, just saying how much uh, it, it means to them, the the apostolate that we're running on on uh, over at catholicculture.org. So yeah, please visit us at our website, catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio uh, before December 8th. We'd must, much appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, yes. And thanks to all those who have already given. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see you next time. Uh, Tree of Wooden Clogs. You can find that on the Criterion channel if you're interested in watching it in, in, in advance of our, of our episode. And uh, we'll see you next time.